There are some of you sitting in this congregation this morning that I hate with an absolute intense hatred. So says Satan. Context is everything. (laughs) Context is everything. But the scriptures do say that our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan knows that he is ultimately defeated. He can't really ultimately attack the good shepherd. And so he goes for the shepherd's sheep. He goes for the father's children, knowing that if he can attack the children, maybe somehow he can lash out at the father. And I think his strategy is to devour the sheep who find themselves furthest away from their shepherd. Now, when you think about David who wrote Psalm 23, he knew what it was like to face literal threats and enemies. He was on the run. Perhaps he wrote Psalm 23 while he was hiding in a cave when Saul and others were hunting him down, trying to kill him. And so he's not writing Psalm 23 from an ivory tower. He's writing knowing that his shepherd is closer than even his worst enemies. And so I want you to turn to our text for today, Psalm 23 and verse 5. You'll see it up on the screen as well, but I encourage you, have it open. You can see the context then of of where we've come. We've come past green pastures and quiet waters. We've been led through this scary valley, and now we find ourselves up here on the mountaintop of summer grazing. And David writes in Psalm 23 and verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Now, if you've read some commentaries, you'll see some commentators believe that from verse 5 onwards, David has left this image of shepherd and sheep behind. He's shelved it, and now he's opened us to a brand new sort of analogy of a host and the guest. But I think that David has laid such a clear foundation, I'm of the opinion that the shepherd-sheep metaphor makes its way right through to the end of the psalm. I don't think it's a hill to die on. If you have a different interpretation, fine. But I think you're going to see that our text can equally apply the whole way through uh, in terms of what David has tried to build here. Because I think the table is a reference to the mountaintop. The sheep are led through the shadowy valley that we looked at last week in verse 4, and now they're up on top of this mountain with summer grazing. And in many parts of the world, the summer range is called by a Spanish word, a mesa. We know that word, mesa. We just think of of Table Mountain. And so David's going to give us, I believe, four truths to strengthen us in the desert. And this series has just been a slow walk. It's not rocket science. We've just camped on each of these phrases and words. We've sought to to look at the background of shepherding. We've sought to apply these things to ourselves, and we're going to do the same thing this morning. So number one, the first truth to strengthen us in our desert, whatever that is, is that there is a table prepared for me. Our text says, you prepare a table for me. Now, if we think of what's required for a diligent good shepherd to provide the summer grazing, it's quite insightful because a good shepherd would have to go ahead of the season up onto the mountaintop. He'd have to suss out the area. He'd have to scout around and make sure that everything was ready and prepared for the sheep. I was reading about certain poisonous plants that if the shepherd doesn't meticulously pluck those poisonous plants out, they they, they contain so much toxicity that if a sheep was to eat that, they could be paralyzed uh, maybe within half an hour. And so he's got to tediously go and bend down and expend effort to, to, to weed out all of those poisonous plants. The shepherd has to go and he has to say, okay, we've, we've maybe been here before a year ago when it was last summer and, and he has to clear out debris from, from wells that have become stopped up or maybe there's little dams that were built in the previous season that are now leaking and he's got to kind of just reinforce them. He's got to walk around and he's got to say, are there any vipers' nests in the ground here? And he's got to pour certain types of things in there to try and flush those snakes out and then kill them. And so he's got to be meticulous in preparing this table for his sheep. Philip Keller, in that excellent book we've been talking about, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, says, My youngsters and I spent days and days going over the ground. It was a recurring task that was done every spring before the sheep went on to these pastures. Though tedious, if my sheep were to survive, it simply had to be done. 
Douglas McMillan is another shepherd, and he says that the preparation of tables, yes, it can refer to the mountaintop, but it could also refer to an ancient oriental practice of, of actually putting the sheep's food on, on little raised tables. And this is what he writes. When the shepherd was on the mountain, the sheep would come in, come in carrying these pests with them. And he's talking now about the grounds that were infested with all sorts of para parasites and, and, and all sorts of uh, bugs and things like that. And he said, and the ground would become so infested. And if the shepherd put their hand feeding down on the ground, they fed not only on the food, but on the bacteria that were there. So the old oriental practice was to use little raised tables, and I think you could think of maybe troughs, that's what a manger is, and they were made out of wood or stone. Perhaps it was even just little rocks, uh, just sort of raised areas where he was able to put the, the, the food down. And he says it would be quite dangerous and harmful to put the food on the grass in the same place every day, because the sheep would be walking it over and over and over. The sheep pick up these parasites, these enemies, and get all sorts of diseases from them. And so as we apply this, we just think of God's diligence in how he has prepared salvation for us. Not just personally, but, but corporately. As we think right throughout the Old Testament, the theologians call it God's progressive revelation. It's kind of like starting in grade one and realizing God has revealed more and more of himself until we, we get to matric and, and, and onto varsity, and then we can, we can understand fully what the cross means. And so I've often thought, why didn't Jesus die immediately after Adam and Eve had sinned? And I think it was because God was preparing us. He wanted to send us the law so, so that we could look in the mirror of the law and, and, and we could say, you're just, I, I thought I was great, but now I recognize that there's a holy God. And, and as I look at myself in this mirror, I recognize I, I can't keep this law. How on earth am I going to be saved? And I feel the weight of my guilt. And that's part of God preparing the table of salvation. And then God sends prophets and teachers to soften our hearts. He wants his truth to come to us. And he wants to say, hey, look forward. There's a Messiah who's coming. I, I, I'm going to prepare a way for him. There's even going to be John the Baptist who prepares the way for my coming son. And then in the fullness of time, the scriptures tell us, God sent his son. And if you know anything of the background of that day and age, God waited till the perfect moment in history to send his son. The Roman world at that time had a Latin word called the Pax Romana, which simply meant the peace of Rome. And so what that meant is that Rome had built all of these roads. They had all this infrastructure so that when Christ came, the gospel could go out. Alexander the Great had conquered most of the known world, and he'd made Greek pretty much the official language throughout the known world. Why? Because as the gospel went out, that common language enabled the gospel to flourish. And so God was able to use even evil and evil men to accomplish his purposes to prepare us for the coming of Christ. And then as the good shepherd laid down his life on the cross, he cried out, it is finished. It is finished. This table that had been prepared from since before the foundation of the world, it was finished. The table was set, and now the invitation could go out that whosoever, come, come and eat, come drink, come buy what will not cost you money. And then think for a moment of your own story. It's been a, a, a while since we've had an, an open mic testimony time, and it's difficult often in a, in a large church to do that, but sometimes at evening services we've done that, and we've shared our stories of how we've come to Christ. And when you think of your story, think of the meticulous preparation. Nothing was haphazard. From God's side, it was orchestrated, it was planned. I think of that little boy that ended up in the desk next to me at Weinberg Boys Junior School in Cape Town when I was in grade five. And maybe some of you have heard the story. And why was he sat in that desk next to me at the beginning of January? Simply because his surname was one letter before mine in the alphabet. And we were sat alphabetically. And his dad had just become the local Baptist pastor. His dad could have gone to any church. He could have gone to any school. I was at that school because my grandfather had been there and my father before me. He could have gone to any grade. He could have been any age. He could have gone to any grade in that grade, but he came and he ended up in the desk next to me. And because of that relationship, he was the first person to ever share the gospel with me. I'd been to church for maybe a year when I was five or six years old. I did not know the gospel. I had never opened a Bible. I knew nothing. The first time I went to church, they were talking about the prodigal son. I'd never heard the story in all my life. 
And through that relationship, not only did I come to know the Lord, but my mom and dad who are sitting up there came to know the Lord a year after, and the three of us were baptized on the same day. And that little boy who was on the desk next to me, he's also gone into the ministry, and he's just accepted the senior pastor position at Honey Ridge Baptist, where I was for 10 years and started there a month ago. Lives two Ks from our doorstep, and it's wonderful to reconnect with him. That's God's preparation just in my life. Imagine we had time to hear the stories. But I think what blows my mind even more is that Jesus is not just the provider of the feast. He is the feast himself. He not only provides it, he says, right, I want you to come and eat and drink of me to feast on me. And if that's not enough to make you gasp with with worship and wonder, then David goes on to draw even more strength in the middle of his desert. Point two, he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He says, number two, that there's a shepherd closer than my enemies. Now, I'm going to ask a very, very vulnerable question. Very vulnerable. You're going to have to really open up this morning. Hands up, who's afraid of a sheep? Who's afraid of the big, bad sheep? Anybody? Oh, we have one. What is that phobia even called? Don't Google it now. I'm curious. Okay, so you're a very rare breed of of uh, somebody who's afraid of sheep. I've never heard about that. Because it's always the other way around, okay? Sheep are the ones who are the ones eaten. And, um, you know, when, when Liesl and the girls went to, to cub some little uh, baby lions, I remember how scared I was of that. I didn't go into the enclosure. And so they went in and I thought, what kind of father are you? You're supposed to be this protector. And I was just like absolutely petrified. And then one of them just sort of jumped up and like actually scratched Liesl. And I thought, this is madness. These things are raging beasts. But I have to confess, unlike you, when I see little lambs and sheep, my heart just moves out towards them. And I'm, I don't feel threatened. I just want to hug them and cuddle them. Now, No lifeguard that I know of ever goes out onto the beach waving and screaming, everybody out of the water, sheep, sheep, sheep. It doesn't happen. And I can't think of any film producer who's made a horror blockbuster about sheep being the main killer animals. You know, sheep 3D or sheep a condor or sheep on a plane or Franken sheep. I don't know. It just wouldn't make it at the box office. It's always sheep zero Predators one. That's the way sheep are made. Defenseless creatures. There's predators on the land. There's predators in the air. And we often don't think of birds of prey. I read harrowing stories of birds of prey that will come down and peck out a sheep's eyes. And other birds of prey that will dive bomb a sheep straight into that rib cage and go for vital organs. It's, it's, a, it's a graphic picture. And so sheep can do very little to protect themselves other than sticking close to their shepherd. Because if a little sheep sticks close to their shepherd, then in him is all the protection and all the resources they need. And so I just love this picture in Psalm 23, verse 5, of the sheep not being influenced by the enemies around them. It's a picture of sheep eating contentedly, but I kind of picture these eyes in the jungle looking out at these sheep. And And what kind of animal knows that their predators are out there and goes to the watering hole and just drinks so contentedly when there's these enemies? Only a sheep who's trusting their shepherd. The enemies are close, but the sheep know that their shepherd is even closer. And someone has said a contented mind is a continual feast. A contented mind is a continual feast. And perhaps if you're honest this morning, you've lived for so long as if you're a sheep without a shepherd. No wonder the scriptures say that you are harassed and helpless. And I want to say, believer, repent. Repent. Invite God to come and to work in your life. You see, the world, your your, your sinful nature, Satan himself, they're watching you worship. They're looking on from the sidelines, and and as you look at them, are you going to allow your enemies to dictate how you feel? Are you going to allow those enemies to say, oh, I've lost my appetite? Are you going to allow those enemies to take your attention of Christ and the reading of his word, whether you should worry or not, whether you'll be driven from prayer and away from God's provision? I say, no ways. The shepherd is here. He is among us. And church, if God is for us, who can be against us? My enemies can watch 
They can say what they want. They can intimidate me. They can threaten me. But ultimately, they can do nothing to spoil my appetite for what God has prepared for me to enjoy. Now, we have to say that by faith because it's a lot harder in reality. And I think back over 23 or 24 years of ministry to some really, really vitriolic, that's a word you can Google because it's the only one that describes vitriolic letters and anonymous notes and emails that I've received. Thankfully, not from this church, so, so it's not a dig at you. But people that have told me to leave the ministry, uh, somebody who created a fake fa Facebook account just so they could post things because the truth of God's word, they'd come in as a visitor. Those are the realities. And in these moments, some of my friends say, Justin, why are you letting it affect you? Why are you letting this, 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 this anger come out and affect you and make you angry in response? And I have to say, Lord, if, you, if you're for us, who can be against us? I'm not talking about healthy criticism. All of us can be idiots, myself included, and we need those rebukes. We need to, to learn. But I'm, I'm talking about real, real attack. And I think I see from Psalm 23 and verse 5 that God doesn't always remove your enemies from you. I don't know why that is. Why does he let them watch on? Why do we have these deserts in which we must find this feast? He wants us to enjoy this table in spite of them. And church, rise up. Don't be intimidated by the gates of hell. We're living in a day and age where the truth of God's word is being backed into a corner, where we're giving up the fight, where we've become weak and timid. But the word of God says the enemies are only threatening us from the sidelines when the Lord is on our side. Psalm 78 and verse 19 is a challenging commentary on the nation of Israel. They doubted God just like you and I do. In the wilderness, in the desert, wandering around, this is how they spoke against God. Psalm 78 and verse 19. They spoke against God saying, can God spread a table in the desert? Can you just hear that mocking in their voice? Can God really spread a table in the desert? That's what they said in Psalm 78. And I wonder if you and I don't sometimes say that, Lord, can you really spread a desert, a, a, ta a table here in the desert? Lord, here in the middle of my Santon, in the traffic, Lord, with the politics in South Africa, with the crime, with all the stuff going on in my life, Lord, can you really, in this dry season, spread this kind of feasting table in the desert? And on the authority of the Word of God, I say, yes, He can. He can, and He can enable you to eat and drink in peace. Through the word, through prayer, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through his presence, by faith God can nourish you and bring comfort to wherever you are, even in the very presence of your enemies. Perhaps that's why Charles Spurgeon says, I believe that one reason why the church of God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. That's the danger, is that we allow these enemies to affect us instead of us affecting them and seeing them converted and the blessing of God flowing to them. John Piper says, the images of the enemies of the sheep being helpless when the shepherd is present. The enemies can only lick their lips from a distance as the shepherd turns a little picnic in the wilderness into a feast. I want you just to have that perspective. They can lick their lips, but God has turned this picnic into a feast. And then listen to our brother Martin Luther. And if you don't know much about church history, don't confuse Martin Luther with Martin Luther King Jr., who lived in the 60s in the U.S. and also was a great man of God. But this is Martin Luther from 500 years ago who brought about the Reformation and nailed those, uh, those papers to the door and uh, brought about just a change within the church. And he wrote many hymns about just enemies and the attacks of Satan and maybe he had a, a greater reality of the presence of these enemies, but he had an even greater reality of trusting God. And this is what he said, being persecuted knowing that he may be put to death for his faith. He said, how then does it happen that Christendom, which is so weak, can withstand the craft and the tyranny of the devil in the world? The Lord is a shepherd. The more the devil and the world plague and torture her, the better she fares. 
You see, he was saying that, that, that principle that, that actually when the church has been persecuted, if you look at church history, that's when the church has really grown. It's been the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And it's a strange thing. It's a paradox. And he says, in this way, I have also been preserved by the grace of God for the past 18 years. I have let my enemies rage, threaten, slander, and damn me. I've let them worry anxiously about how they might kill me and destroy my teaching, or rather God's. Moreover, I've been happy and of good cheer, at one time better than at another. He's just being honest and saying, look, I haven't always been cheerful. It's been a challenge. I've not worried greatly about their raging and raving, but have clung to the staff of comfort and found my way to the Lord's table. That is, I've committed my cares to our Lord God. Therefore, let every Christian thoroughly learn this art, to cling to this rod and this staff and to find his way to this table when sorrow or misfortune appears. Then he will surely gain strength and comfort for everything that worries him. Chief, can I say to you before I move off this point, if you're going to focus and look at your enemies, it's going to ruin your appetite for this table. Can I encourage you, look to Christ. Keep your gaze there. Even look away from your own sinful nature. Look to the shepherd and you will enjoy this table in the midst of the wilderness. But the choice is yours. The choice is yours. Well, the third truth, to strengthen you in the desert, comes from our text. You anoint my head with oil. There is oil to anoint my head. See, one of the great dangers for sheep in the summertime was being harassed and plagued by all sorts of insects and bugs and gnats and flies and, and, and there's just these parasites that suck the life out of them. And Philip Keller says, sheep are especially troubled by the nose fly. These little flies buzz about the sheep's head, attempting to deposit their eggs on the damp mucous membranes of the sheep's nose. And if they're successful, the eggs will hatch and in a few days form small slender worm-like larvae. They work their way up the nasal passages into the sheep's head. They burrow into the flesh and they set up an intense irritation accompanied by severe inflammation. For relief from this agonizing annoyance, sheep will deliberately beat their heads against trees, rocks, posts. They'll rub their heads in the soil. In extreme cases of intense infestation, a sheep may even kill itself in a frenzied endeavor to gain respite from the aggravation. What a graphic picture. And you know what, I think it's not always these external big enemies that get to us. It's sometimes the ongoing little irritations that drive us mad. And a good shepherd will come with his oil and he will pour it over that sheep's head. He will anoint that head completely. He'll make sure that oil gets into the nostrils and think of the soothing, calming relief, the peace that that would bring a harassed and helpless sheep. It's not every molehill in our lives that's a mountain. We recognize that. But when you take a lot of molehills and they suddenly begin to pile up in your life, it can feel like an Everest is driving you mad. I remember when my little brother was five years old. His name's Seth. And I'm the eldest of four. Uh, and Seth is the youngest. And there's 14 years between us. So when he was about five, I was a first year arrogant theological student. And sometimes I put my brother to bed. And he would pray the same thing every single night. And as a theologian, I wondered about this prayer. I wondered, can God really answer this prayer? Is this really good theology? Do you know what his prayer was? Every night, dear Lord Jesus, please help the mosquitoes not to come. <laughs> please help the mosquitoes not to come. And I would wrestle and think, is that a prayer that the Lord can answer? Will the Lord just wipe out all the mosquitoes in the universe? That would be great. And then it reminded me of a question. I was teaching five-year-olds Sunday school at that time. It was the toughest theological question I've ever been asked in all my years. This five-year-old said, Uncle Justin, why did God make mosquitoes? <laughs> so if any of you have the answer to that, please, I'm still waiting um, for the Lord to answer that. But I think the Lord is concerned about the little things that irritate us. I think the answer is yes. Because the Lord knows that it's the ongoing attacks, it's the repeated 
irritations that drive us away from his provisions in Christ. And yes, sometimes it is those enemies, but sometimes it's the enemies closer to home that are buzzing there, and we kind of maybe don't notice them before because we see these big predators, these big monsters out there. And sometimes the problem in the church is not our enemies outside. Sometimes it's the enemy within and the enemy within. It's the subtle things. It's the little fatal flaws. It's just, the, ugh, it's just a little fleeting glance at pornography. What's that? You know, Adam, it's just a little bite, Adam. It's just one small bite. It's just a small sin. But friends, in God's economy, there's no such thing as a small sin. There's no such thing as just a, a moment of apathy. It's the small foothold that can later grow to become Satan's stronghold. In mythology, we know it was Achilles' heel that was his downfall. It was the little chink in, his, in the armor right there in the heel that was his downfall. And so the Lord knows that small sins have the potential to destroy us. And so he wants to come and he wants to anoint our head with his oil. And so I think the Lord may not stop the mosquitoes from coming. But what he has promised is a buffer between us and the mosquitoes. Because we said he doesn't remove those enemies, but he's promised his oil, a buffer between us and them. And oil in the scriptures is a wonderful picture of God's Holy Spirit, the precious Spirit of God, His gracious presence in our lives, the, the anointing, the imagery of being set apart, not being like our friends who are harassed and helpless because they don't have a shepherd, recognizing that if we do have a shepherd, we should be li living differently and we should be inviting them to experience how we experience our shepherd. If we had time, we could unpack this beautiful analogy of oil. But I just want to ask, is the Holy Spirit's oil, is his fruit evident in your life? And maybe if you want to know the answer to that, ask your spouse, particularly if you're married. Honey, do you see God's Spirit at work in my life? It's a challenging question. Because if you were to ask Liesl, perhaps on certain days she'd say, I see a spirit of grumpiness. A little bit irritable. You've come home and you're a little bit short with the girls. Okay, I know Amber's a learner driver, but calm down. <laughs> but that's, that's sometimes our reality. And I wonder how much of my life and seasons in my ministry where I have not depended on the Holy Spirit, I've depended on Justin. And how can Justin be a Messiah? How can you and I solve the world's problems? It's God's spirit. When you are dependent on God's spirit, you can do more. You can cope with more. You can say no to sin more. You will change the world more. Being filled with the spirit is what somebody said to me is the difference between just having a chainsaw that's plugged in or filled up with fuel versus a chainsaw that's not. Yeah, maybe you can kind of just grind away at this tree if it doesn't have power or it's run out of petrol. But, but when that chainsaw has, has power within and, and you are dependent on that power, how much better, how much more effective you can be. And so the good shepherd must apply this oil to us on an ongoing basis. Yes, when we come to Christ, we are filled with the Spirit. We have the Spirit. But the Scriptures also tell us there's an ongoing experience of the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, be filled. It's a command, ongoing, continuous, present tense. Be filled and continue to be filled. Cry out to God, God, I need you to fill me afresh with your Spirit. Lord, come do a new work in my life. One dosage of oil isn't enough for the whole of summertime. Shepherd can't just say, okay, I've done that. Now you sort it for the rest of summer. No, it's ongoing. It's up close and personal. It's continuous. Cry out to God that the Holy Spirit would make Christ real so that you can leave behind feeling harassed and helpless. Invite God. Repent of your sins. Be done with self-sufficiency and come to Christ. And then fourthly, this fourth wonderful truth to strengthen and encourage you in the desert. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. There is a cup overflowing. What a picture of abundance. God is not a stingy God. The biggest challenge for a shepherd in the summertime was to keep those sheep well hydrated. How challenging in the midst of the wilderness. How challenging on top of the mountain. Maybe in certain areas the shepherd would find a spring. Maybe it was a well and he'd have to keep drawing water out of that well for his sheep. Maybe there were those, those troughs that he would have to fill. 
And sheep don't generally like to get wet, so you'd have to fill them to the brim and so that they were even overflowing so that the sheep could drink and get enough. Sometimes shepherds had, had leather pouches, kind of like buckets, and they would fill those and let them overflow. And that good shepherd was nothing like the hired hand. The hired hand was there only for the pay. He wasn't concerned about the sheep, and so he might not fill it to the top. He might let the sheep have a few little sips and then shoo, shoo, shoo. Because if a, if a shepherd had a, a flock of 350 sheep, it, were, it was incredible diligence to keep drawing so they all had enough to drink. But the hired hand, get away sheep. I, don't wanna, I just want to sit here under a tree. I don't want to keep drawing water for you. Just shoo, shoo, shoo. And our shepherd, our good shepherd, is so diligent. When last have you stopped to count your blessings in Christ. Our cup overflows because the shepherd keeps filling our cups. Maybe sometimes we have a different perspective on what we need versus what we want. That was verse one. And so we think, oh, look at their cup. Why isn't mine overflowing? Mine seems so empty. My friend, maybe you have the wrong perspective on what God's doing in your life. But here, David is not just talking about the sufficiency of Christ and the sufficiency of God's word. He's talking about that, but he's talking about more. He's talking about the abundance, the superabundance. This is poured out more than we need abundance of living water. So many texts we could turn to, but these were two that came to my mind. Ephesians 1. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. 1 John 3, 1, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us. And as we come to Easter, we think of our Lord in that garden of Gethsemane. He stared into a cup. It was a cup that was also overflowing, but it was overflowing with judgment and wrath and suffering. And he looked into that cup and he said, my Father, if it be possible that this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will but as you will. And he drank that cup to the dregs. He licked it clean. And he took upon himself the wrath and the judgment that should have been mine so that he could hand me a cup that is overflowing with blessing because he took the curse. That's the Savior we worship. And your little feeble cup can, can never hold and contain all of Christ. You can never Say, I've got all of God. I've got all of the Holy Spirit. There is always more. That's why your cup overflows. Your little feeble cup cannot contain all the love of God. It's an incredible thought. There's always more. There's always more for you to know and more for you to experience. And if your cup is overflowing, then won't you put your cup and allow it to flow over into others that are less fortunate than you. For those who do not yet have gospel blessings, won't you allow God's cup to overflow on the high mountains so that it can flow down into the valleys of other, others that you know who don't yet know the shepherd? We can only echo the hymn writer, and the words are on the screen. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure. I dare you to go out tomorrow and find such extravagant love anywhere else. Will you find it in another religion, another philosophy, another person, another thing? Are you going to go back to parasite-infested pools of water when what's offered to you is a never-ending supply of living water, a feast in the desert? As we close... There are two words in our text that you may have missed because I left them out. And I decided to end with them today. Psalm 23 and verse 5. Just two words. It's the words before me. You prepare a table before me. And you might say, Justin, what on earth is so special about two little words before me? Well, in the Hebrew, it's only one word. And it's the word panim, which simply means face. F-A-C-E. All of this is prepared and done before me right in front of my face. 
That's what the Hebrew is saying. You are so close, it's staring you in the face. I think an old Afrikaans translation is the only translation I could find that captures this nuance. It says, Voor my aangezicht. God does all of this right there before my face. And he does that because it's an invitation to come, to come and feast, to come and enjoy this provision. But you have to appropriate it. You have to apply it. You have to give up nibbling at the parasites on the ground and focusing on the enemies, and you have to come and enjoy him. What more must Christ do than has been done? He's done all the work of preparation. You can't get any closer And yet in your experience today, you could be so far. And so I close with this story. I read that back in 2012, there was a homeless man by the name of Timothy Gray. He lived in Wyoming in the USA. And unfortunately, it was a very cold winter. I think it was about the 30th of December when he passed away. And as a homeless man, he went to sleep under this railroad bridge and he froze to death was discovered on the last day of 2012 by some children who were sledding down there and they discovered this homeless man's body. But what Timothy Gray didn't know was that he was a millionaire. He didn't know that he had an inheritance of $19 million as part of a $300 million estate. The lawyers had been looking for him for years and no one had ever found him. He died there as a homeless millionaire. He actually owned it all, but he didn't possess it. And I say, sheep, what's the point of having all of this provision before your face? To be walking past the bank and to know you have all these resources in the bank, but you never withdraw them, you never access them, you never actually avail yourselves of them. It's folly. David has come in Psalm 23 and verse 5 and he's read your inheritance to you. He said, this is your inheritance. That when you came to Christ, when he became your shepherd, all the resources and spiritual blessings in Christ are yours. The scriptures say you have everything that you need for life and for godliness to live the Christian life, to be fruitful and productive. But then why do so many sheep live in self-imposed poverty? It's because they do not appropriate the spiritual resources. You are far better than Timothy Gray because you know, you have heard today about these resources, but even knowing about them cannot satisfy your famished appetite unless you taste and see that the Lord is good. And to allow yourself to just leave this building, to go out into Monday, and to spiritually starve tomorrow in the desert when a table is prepared right before you, wherever you find yourselves, is unthinkable, brothers and sisters. All is prepared The table has been set, and now comes this invitation. Come, feast, eat, and drink. Let's pray together. Well, Lord, we thank you for your invitations. Lord, we just think back in the scriptures of how many times you use the word come. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Come, let us shout aloud. You call us to come. All you who are weary and heavy laden, you tell us to come and to buy wine and milk without cost. You tell us to come though our sins are like scarlet and they will be made white as snow. Oh Lord, these invitations to to open the floodgates and to come to the wedding feast of the Lamb as you said in that parable, call them to come in because those who were originally called have not decided to come. Oh Lord, may we not be those who have all this provision in Christ, but to be living as if we're spiritual paupers, and yet, Lord, we have this great inheritance. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you've done, the blood that you sweat. Lord, the effort and energy that you expended to save us, to come an infinite distance, to die upon that cross. Lord, with every dying breath, you looked into the future and you saw every one of us sitting here this morning. And Lord, you said, I died for you. Our Lord, may we respond, Lord, your faithfulness goes before us. Lord, you are the God of angel armies who is with us. That Lord, as those enemies look on, your hand is upon us, you are protecting us. Lord, I pray that we might rest in your provision and know that you are indeed faithful. You're faithful to your promises. You're faithful to your people. You're faithful to your church, even when we are unfaithful. Thank you for your faithfulness. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.